Welcome to Ed Talks. My name is Dr. Janae Nugent. I'm in the Department of History and I'm a Board of Governors Teaching Chair at the University of Lethbridge. I would like to begin our session today by acknowledging that the University of Lethbridge rests on traditional Blackfoot territory. At the University of Lethbridge, we begin our meetings with a traditional Blackfoot greeting, Oki Nitsu Kawawa which means welcome to our friends and neighbors. I'm not sure that I get the pronunciation entirely correct. I would like to welcome Dr. Sheila McManus to our Ed Talk today. Thank you. You have just been awarded the Distinguished Teaching Award, so congratulations. Thank you. It's very thank exciting you. and very well deserved. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it was really exciting. One of my students from my first year class last fall nominated me, so it sort of, it was a surprise. Um, to even get the nomination, ah. so that was really nice. It was a first year student that yeah. nominated you. Oh, yeah. that's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, I definitely want to talk about first year classes <laughs> with you. <laughs> yeah, so. we should do that. Yeah, well before we get into the first year classes, I wanted to maybe start a little bit um, talking about uh, what your teaching journey has been, getting to know you a little bit, and where did you uh, begin your, your journey? For me, it began in grad school. Uh, my PhD program was, it was a big, tough program. It wasn't sort of a warm, fuzzy, supportive program, you know, at all. So it was a very long uh, stretch of time when I was doing my PhD, but I was TAing all the way throughout. And even then, the TAing is what I loved. It's what made me happy. There were some years where I was not sure I wanted to continue in grad school at all, um, but I loved TAing so much. I knew that I loved teaching. Um, and I would watch the people I was TAing for and I'd think, what would I do differently? Would I do it that way? Would I do that differently? And I was able to TA for a wide variety of courses. Um, and I don't remember how, but I managed to kind of stumble across a couple of really good books on teaching. So the first two books I read were um, Bell Hook's Teaching to Transgress uh, and Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And I don't remember now if someone directed me towards those two books, but I had read those two I think kind of fairly late in the game of the PhD, and it just, those two in particular, because they pair so well, it's like, yeah, that's the kind of teacher I want to be. Um, so l l falling in love with teaching is the only thing that got me through grad school, really. And then I taught uh, in Winnipeg for a year before coming here, and it was one of those, you know, kind of classic sessional years where you've got this crazy intense teaching load, and all you do is you seem to write lectures morning, noon, and night. Um, and it was a wide variety of courses again, but. I remember how much fun it was. I mean, not just, of course, you know, being done and, and, and actually having a job and the insecurities of being on the job market, but I remember really loving that year in spite of the insanity of kind of having a 3-3 load, all new courses, nothing but lecture writing it felt like at the time. Um, I really loved that year. I thought, yeah, okay. And then the next year I started here and it was exactly the kind of school that I wanted to wind up with because it was small, because the classes were small, because the department already had a tradition of getting to know our students, of, of you know, um, going to the wall to maintain small class sizes and, and that kind of thing. And then I was just extremely lucky. So I think there was a certain foundation maybe before I got here, but I was really lucky in that in the first couple of years, um, our colleague Heidi McDonald introduced me to Pat Chetrick, Patricia Chetrick, um, who was kind of just winding down her career um, for medical reasons. Um, and she became this enormously important mentor for me. So for the first few years of teaching here, there were always other people around to have conversations with. You and I talked about it a lot. But anything, if I was trying to work out a new assignment, if there was something I was, you know, I could go to Pat. Um, so we had coffee, you know, not quite almost every week, but close for the first few years. Um, and she would just start with, how's your teaching going? And it didn't matter if something had gone really well, if something had gone really badly, which certainly goes badly more often than not in the first few years, still now, perhaps. But uh, she would always help me sort of figure out, you know, what, had, what I felt had gone wrong, what I could fix. But if there was something I knew I wanted to try, I could always run it by her. Um, and I just, it mattered so much, I think, to have her for the first few years. And then I fell in, I fell in with a different crowd uh, about six <laughs> years ago when we started offering the instructional skills workshop here. And my very first, when I first took the ISW, which was in August of 2012, um, I was in there with um, Robin Bright from Ed, Uta, Uta Kota from uh, Biochem, and Lisa Doolittle from Fine Arts. And it was just, you know, three women, exceptional teachers, certainly all of us at very different stages of our careers, 
and from very different disciplinary backgrounds. And that would wind up being an even bigger, another really big turning point for me was understanding how much I had to learn from people with different backgrounds, right? Instead of always just thinking that, well, only, only two historians can ever talk about teaching history. Right. Or Pat was a sociologist, but she was so good at what she did and you know, so gifted as a teacher. She was the first 3M winner U of L ever had um, and the only one for a long time until Shelley won. And so the ISW introduced me to the notion of this interdisciplinary conversations about teaching. Um, and that wound up being another big turning point for me in terms of having a whole new teaching community, really helping me understand this, the value of talking across disciplines about teaching. And it really got me excited about the power, even more excited I think about the power of mentoring because I know how much I've benefited from having a mentor like Pat um, and then having a community there's always other amazing teachers on campus that I can call up at any time and say, I've got this idea, can I try it? Yeah. What do you think would work or not work? You know? And that's one of the things about the U of L that I love too is that we really do have this community yeah. of teaching, yeah. right? Yeah. That we're all pursuing teaching excellence, whatever that might be, right? <laughs> but that um, Absolutely. It, it is something that we do talk about. There are a number yeah. of people that you can contact. And always. I was, yeah, I was doing a session with the um, University of Rhode Island and Rutgers, I think, um, last summer. And they were so excited to, and they were talking about classroom space and scale-up mm -hmm. classrooms and that sort of a thing. And so I'd been asked to Skype in, and Harold Jansen did as well. And um, yeah, and they were just so excited to have people to talk to. And they said, can we, maybe we should do this, you know, like Skype meeting sort of a thing every, you know, every two weeks or something. Yeah. And I wow. went, oh dear. <laughs> That's a lot of extra work. That's we have lot. lots of people we talk to here. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so they ended up setting up a community in sort of the eastern yeah. seaboard that nice. they that nice. they could have. But you know, it's not necessarily always something that is pre present or prevalent. No. Anyhow, on no, it takes work. Campuses. It takes work to build it. It yeah. takes active work to maintain the connections. You know, we're lucky to have a teaching center that has helped facilitate some of these conversations. And then, you know, a lot of what happens elsewhere, it's been, you know, great teachers on campus finding each other in other contexts and suddenly realizing, oh, you like it as much as I do. You, you know, let's talk and keeping in touch. And I think, you know, there's been work, doesn't feel like work, but there's been work that goes into maintaining, I think, this community and always being open to, you know, you hear about some great new teacher, like I said, like the, you know, the, the guy who's only been teaching for a year and just won one of the student union teaching awards. And my first thought was, I so want to meet you. Like, <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing? You know, yeah. after only your first year to have already won one of the student union awards. And I just thought, oh, that's amazing. I want to talk to you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I think we all do that. Well, and you've really taken a lead on campus as well in creating these conversations and um, and ways in which people can enter into those conversations if they don't know how to already, especially well, I think that's the funny thing, faculty. too, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, because faculty, we know how to talk to each other in our discipline. And you have a conference, you have this and that. And for me, it's... It's paying it forward. It is just, it is paying forward the hundreds of hours of Pat's time that I have benefited from. So it's just feeling like I have an obligation because I had her, still have um, so much of her time. For me, it's just been like, pay it forward. This matters, you know, whether it's feeling Teaching isn't always recognized or valued as much as research at the modern university for lots of reasons. Um, so, you know, I think maybe too many teachers feel a bit isolated. Um, I know I've been much happier since finding this, this community of other people who are just as intense about it as I am, you know, and you're not kind of the over the top one in the room. <laughs> <laughs> It has mattered to me to just keep trying to foster any kind of connections we can between all of us who love teaching, who want to talk more about it, um, and trying to find unusual ways of doing it too. Like, you know, the, there's the conference mode that makes us comfortable, but are there other ways we could do it, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Well, and you've done different things like the Heart of Teaching yeah. and the Open Doors. Yeah, Heart of Teaching, I think, started maybe before I was board chair. Yeah, it did start before I was board chair. Um, so I was board chair 2014 to 2016, and Heart of Teaching had begun. It was very much this idea of trying to find, trying to find other ways for faculty to just talk to each other about teaching. So, and I ran it past Harold Jansen first. He and I, we always see each other at New Student Orientation and um, Open House, so I knew he would be there. And I'm like, I have this idea. You know, I wanted literally to try to mimic the feeling I had had with Pat, which is like, come in, sit down, have a cup of coffee, how's your teaching going? Right? and just find somebody to talk to. So we set it up as 
um, I kind of, you know, built this, I found this little group of people who were willing to be these drop-in, you know, informal mentors, really, in a way, although we didn't even like the mentoring language because we felt that that was too, it wasn't collaborative and collegial enough. Mm -hmm. So we kept trying to sort of get away from the mentoring language a little bit. We just wanted to create a space where you could drop in, have a cup of coffee, and talk to somebody else about teaching. Um, and we didn't always get a big turnout. Um, we, we joked when we finally wound it down that, you know, the, the peer facilitators, we had talked to each other. I designed whole new assignments based on conversations, <laughs> a conversation I had one day when I was in, when I was, you know, doing the heart of teaching with um, Jace Larondo and John Sheriff, and it just gave me this idea for um, other ideas. So we didn't always have people come, you know, drop in. It's hard for faculty to fit stuff into their time. You know, we were never sure, is there a better time? Is there a better place? It's also just a weird model, maybe. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's not comfortable to walk into a room with people you don't know yeah. and say, something's just gone horribly wrong in my class or, you know, whatever. Um, so we felt pretty good about it after the, like, at, at two or three years, I think, maybe it ran. And then doors open. So I was doing, I was facilitating an instructional skills workshop at the college. And I was talking to one of their guys there and he mentioned this thing that they had tried in the previous months called doors open. I'm like, well, what's that? And he described it to me. I'm like, that sounds amazing. I want to try that. So it was one of the first things I, I knew that I wanted to do my first year as board chair. And the idea is just, Instead of always teaching in isolation, we know there's amazing teachers all over campus, but we never actually see each other do that part of our job. So set up a schedule, right? You know, I reached out to, I did not think initially so many people would say yes, because I think I emailed like a couple of dozen, two or three dozen people <laughs> on campus and said, either people that I knew or people that I'd heard, you know, would you be interested in opening the doors of your classroom? one day this term and we advertise it and then anybody who wants to come see you teach can come see you teach and almost everybody said yes which again I think really speaks to the community on this campus that we're all very generous you know instead of wanting to, to give that to other people um, so the schedule wound up uh, considerably more crowded than I had expected but I didn't want to say no to anybody either right. so I just went with the crowded schedule and it meant that there wasn't always a lot of attendance I went to almost all of them and it was fantastic um, and there were sometimes you know a handful of other people there but it was it was across campus it was you know um, different disciplines I did I deliberately went after more senior sort of tenured faculty because what I didn't want was anybody more junior to feel say a bit nervous you know what if they had someone come observe their teaching and they're going up for tenure next year or whatever so I had, I had initially targeted the more senior and experienced teachers on campus and it was just amazing I mean it gave me a whole new appreciation for how many great teachers there are on this campus for the amazing work being done in different disciplines you know I got to sit in on <laughs> one of Olu Woshiga's stats classes. And I feel like I understood like a little bit of what he was doing, you know, and, and the students were laughing a lot at his stats jokes. So I thought that was good. And I sat in one of Hattie Karagani's math classes. And again, I had the tiniest feeling like maybe I had some clue of what he was trying to teach. I sat in on classes, you know, all across campus. And it was just, again, I enjoyed it very much. You know, other people certainly came out to it. And the second year, I ran it a second year and deliberately tried to scale it back. Um, as I had said, I got a bigger response than I expected the first year, so it was way overscheduled. There were way too many options for people to attend. So the second year, I deliberately scaled it back, um, and it let me pick up on people who'd been on leave the first year. And, right. you know, yeah. um, I wanted people, I wanted to see people in different sizes of classrooms, different disciplines of classrooms, you know, that kind of thing. I thought it was just great. And it would be another way for people to just, again, to meet each other, to just foster connection, because then you could say, I came to your class, I came and, and saw you teach. Um, and I heard sort of anecdotally, I didn't follow up on any of this, but I heard anecdotally that there were at least a few of those kinds of connections being made. Mm -hmm. You know, that you didn't have to necessarily know the person whose classroom you were coming to, but it was the doors open days, so you could just come in, you know, sit in the back, um, and then feel like you had at least, you know, kind of some kind of connection with them. So, um, yeah, it was, I enjoyed it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was really interesting because I did one of the sessions and I was in yeah. the scale-up classrooms, yep. uh, or in the scale-up classroom, and uh, I had somebody come specifically because they were interested in the scale-up classroom, yep. had no idea what to do with it, and yeah. so they, you know, they weren't necessarily interested in the witch hunts. <laughs> <laughs> but that helped. <laughs> that helped bring 
bring some other people in. <laughs> yeah. I think I had three people yeah. in. Um, but one person came specifically because yeah. they're interested in exploring what a different type of classroom situation might be. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. I think that was one of the most useful days because was it maybe the second year? And again, I had specifically wanted to show people in that room, using that room, and it was one of the best attended doors open that we'd had maybe kind of those whole two years because people were so keen on it. It was a combination of this, absolutely the instructor that's in the room that, at that point, but wanting to see, okay, how does a good instructor who really understands this room use this room? Yeah. You know, and I think those were some of the most useful days because that was, yeah, people were coming for that. Um, you know, I went to one, was it your class with somebody else? And there were like six of us sitting at one of the, you know, <laughs> tables kind of watching what's going on. I, right. you know, it was great. Yeah, yeah, no, it's very interesting. And, yeah. it and again, it creates that community and it allows that entry point to in for whoever's Entry point, interested. thank you. I think that's a great yeah. way of phrasing it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, it's a funny, it's the funny, awkward part of what we do. There's no formal structure for it. We have to make our own entry points in lots of different ways. So, you know, any, any entry point you can make for any teacher, even if it's just come see one class and then you've met maybe one other person on campus or, you know, I could pass somebody in the hallway and say, I sat in on your class last week. Fantastic. It was so much fun. Right. You know, so it was just, you know, anything to help people connect, help the teachers on this campus connect with the other teachers on this campus. Yeah, I was speaking to Ann Diamond and she really mm -hmm. talked about how mm -hmm. the ISW is a transformative experience for her. Yeah. And I think a lot of it, she, you know, part of it's the reflective teaching practice and everybody mm -hmm. just appreciates that so much. Mm -hmm. um, but I was in China recently do, and they, um, there was two people from Conestoga College and one of them is a rep on the ISW International Committee. Oh, cool. And so she'd been invited because they were quite interested in bringing yeah, ISW yeah, to China. I and I was talking to her and, you know, we're in these meetings and, I mean, I couldn't represent ISW because I've only just taken the session. Um, but I had checked into how many people had done our ISWs nice, and then yeah. how many people had been trained as facilitators. Yep. And she said, what is going on in your kid? <laughs> <laughs> Those are really, really strangely high numbers, right? Yeah. <laughs> Especially for the facilitation. And, yeah. you know, I didn't really have an answer because it wasn't, it's not, it's not something that I'm deeply involved in. Um, but again, you know, Anne was saying she wanted to just keep doing the ISW and that's yeah. part of why she wanted to do it. And, yeah. that's, and that was my gut feeling. That's what I had said <laughs> to them is I think it's just because everybody loves it so much. Yeah. And it's, again, that reflective teaching practice, you get to do that with your colleagues, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it just really creates that sense of community and yeah. just that uh, the energy because yeah. this job can be really, really exhausting, yeah. but it gives you that yeah. energy to kind of keep going and pursuing and pushing yourself yeah. as an instructor. So yeah. Yeah. We're kind of unique. Um, that, that is one of the unique features of the ISW here. I, I was, I've done a little bit of research on it and it's something I want to sort of pursue. Um, we're, we're a little bit different in that all of our facilitators here are faculty or instructors. Yeah. Um, and it was something that mattered to us kind of from the very beginning was that kind of by faculty for faculty, creating a community, the peer mentoring possibilities. Um, so it's really mattered to us to sort of keep that way at most of the campuses because of the demands on faculty time, right? And, and you know, anyone who wants to become a facilitator has to understand that you're not getting paid, you're not getting, you know, there's other places. So for example, the college here does actually pay their instructors when they facilitate. Yeah. At most other schools, at least in Canada that run the ISW, it's primarily staff. So it's part of their job, you know, to do it. And I think that's also a, a great model. But because for us, kind of the, the initial group of us, so, you know, we finished our ISW in August of 2012, and then, you know, we did the facilitator training the very next spring. Right. And it's just something that we wanted to stick with. You know, not that it's necessarily a better or worse model, but for us, it's a really powerful model that it is, you're in there with other people. All of our facilitators have, I want to say at the very least, like 10 to 12 years of post-secondary teaching experience, all the way up to 25 odd years. We ask a lot of them, right? Because it's an extra five full days of training, and then you are, you know, every ISW is four full days, you know, and the only compensation is, you know, you kind of have to love it. You sort of have to believe in the program, you know, a little bit, which makes it sound a little bit cultish, um, <laughs> which was a problem we had, I think, the first couple of years. <laughs> I'm trying to sound a little less cultish. Certainly not everyone that takes it is going to find it to be a transformative thing. It was for me. Um, so I bought in early and hard, you know, on this, I did. Um, and I'm now one of the two people, Rob and Bright and I are the two, we then did the next level of training, which allows us to train our own facilitators. So mm -hmm. it's completely in-house for us. And that mattered to us as well, because you're in here, as I say, every facilitator is someone else who gets what a classroom is like, 
you know, they have had those classroom disasters. They know what a first year versus a fourth year class is like and why those are not the same things. Or, you know, but they're bringing that. We try to get a range of disciplinary backgrounds. We try not to ever have two people from the same discipline co-facilitating mm -hmm. because there's a worldview. You and I are both historians and we have a certain view yeah. of how we teach and maybe even our teaching challenges have been similar. How much more interesting is it to hear from someone in the natural sciences? Or we now have facilitators from all the faculties. We've also have got fine arts, health sciences, and management. And just be able to share that experience of completely different teaching contexts, and yet the profound similarities. Right. Um, and I think it's the similarities, for me, it's the similarities that are so much more amazing every time that you think these people have a different world than you do and they don't, right? <laughs> right? right. In the classroom, we're all kind of in the same world, you know? So yeah, not everybody, you know, leaves it thinking, I want to keep doing this every summer. Um, some of us do and we go on to become facilitators. <laughs> um, but it's nice, we've, we've been able to really evolve in the last six years as well. Um, we've now really, it's much more customized, I want to say. It's still the ISW. We still follow that, you know, kind of that model and that, that schedule. But we've really been able to tinker it so that it works for our U of L people here. And it's based on our experiences here as teachers here and these classrooms. And we know who our students are here. Mm -hmm. um, so we just finished another facilitator development workshop. Um, and I was saying that I, I'm kind of really proud of that, that the journey that the ISW has taken in the last six years of, I think we're doing a better job. You know, I think we're doing a better job of making sure that the entry points, there are multiple entry points for everybody in every workshop. I think we started off much more prescriptive and a little bit didactic about, you know, mm -hmm. you're gonna do it this way and you're gonna love this as much as I love it. Right. <laughs> um, and you don't have to love it as much as I love it, actually. You can take, any anybody who takes one of these, we've, we now do them for grad students as well, you can take away whatever you're going to take away from this, you know, but give me four days, four days out of your year is all I'm asking for. And you will be, hopefully, you'll be maybe a little bit happier as a teacher, you'll be maybe a little bit more effective as a teacher. And for me, another one of the powerful takeaways is you'll know other people on campus that care about teaching as much as you do outside your own department or yeah. outside your own faculty, right? It's those entry points again. Yeah, and it's been really fun because I have been on committees now with some of the people that were in my <laughs> ISW. And we, and it's interesting because you know, all of a sudden we'll be like, but what about the teaching, you know? Like, and we'll both look at each other and it'll be this like, wait a minute, right? And it's like, you know you have somebody who's similarly yeah. passionate as you are, that yeah. as, you know, so much of the work of campus is done at a committee level yeah. and we all sit on these committees. So it's so great to keep, you know, the, the, the teaching as the prime focus. Yeah. We don't lose track of that because yeah. you've got this whole community of people who are out there yeah. and you know, and you're yeah. in a meeting. And you're never gonna be alone yeah. in a room anymore. Yeah. You know, <laughs> at any committee meeting, there will be somebody else because we've now done, mm -hmm. you must be the reason why Jeff asked me that question because we've now more yeah. than 50 faculty have completed the program. Oh yes, right? yeah. Um, yeah. As well, a dozen grad students, I think as well, by the end of this summer, we'll be up to, you know, sort of 55 faculty and hopefully another. Um, five grad students. I'm doing another one at the end of this month. So yeah, you're never the only person in the room. If you want to stick your hand up and say yes, but what about the teaching? Yeah, you, there'll be somebody else, guaranteed. Yeah, you know, which is um, great. Who was? Oh yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and take it seriously. Yeah. yeah, for sure. And I mean, and also the same sort of works with the teaching center, right? Yeah, if you're for sure. yeah. a fellow with somebody yeah. or, you know, in the teaching center yeah. advisory council or something. So it's, yeah, I think we've done a great job of. Yeah, it's <laughs> a really multifaceted community, yeah. but we all have so much in common. Like almost all of us, whether it's, they don't all have to have taken the ISW, but it's time in the teaching center, right? Yeah. On that council or whatever. So yeah. it's Different this ways. multifaceted teaching community, but we've all got a lot of shared um, experiences that way, yeah. you know, that gives you something else to talk about. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yes, and builds that like emphasis. Yeah. So it's great. Yeah. Um, another thing that I wanted to talk to you about uh, that I am sure was part of the reason that you won your Distinguished <laughs> Teaching Award uh, was the first year experience and first year classes. I, I'm super passionate about yeah. them. I yeah. know you're super yeah. passionate about yeah. them. I think we come at them quite differently, but I'm always inspired by um, you and frankly awed at your ability <laughs> to 
Thank like you. manage, <laughs> well, manage student engagement when mm. you've got a class. I mean, our first year classes in history were 90 students. Yeah. Next semester, they're 75, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which will be great. <laughs> so we're trying to get, you know, the smaller classroom experiences mm. if at all possible. But um, to keep students actively engaged yeah. in, in a classroom that size is a challenging yeah. Um, endeavor, and I know that I'm forever pursuing it. And, yeah. But you've come up with some really interesting yeah. ways of doing that. Yeah. And again, I have to give credit to Pat Chetrick for this because I didn't teach the big first year classes my first couple years here. I forget when I first started teaching it. And so by the time kind of my turn was up and I was about to dive into that big 90 student class for the first time, I already knew what kind of teaching I liked and what I mattered, what mattered to me. And I remember talking to Pat and saying, Oh, I don't think I can do discussion, and she said, of course you can. I go, oh, okay, I just needed someone to say that you could. <laughs> you know, I, I guess I can. Why should I think that I can't? Okay, um, and then she really helped get me through kind of that first year, um, where it says, if you just start with the assumption that yes, you can, then you just, you know, you hate to sound like a cliche, but it turns out you actually can, you know? <laughs> You just put a bit of thought into it, and you just put a bit of structure into it, you know? <laughs> so even with 90 students, the first year class is the only class where I still lecture, maybe two thirds of the time. But there's still, of course, there's a range of different ways to even make a lecture much more active and engaging, whether it's we do a little bit of predictive at the beginning, like, okay, why do you think I've got this on the outline? Or what did we do last class? Or how does this relate to your other readings? Or, you know, stop for a second and talk to the person next year. All those classic little, little yeah. things you can do in class. Um, but a quarter to a third, I'm slowly moving it up to about a third, is still active, not lecturing, you know. And it's just, it's been about um, figure out what I want to do and prep the structure ahead of time. So I will always, so it's normally based around a primary source document, of course, because this is a first year history class. So I'll, I'll send out a sheet or I'll post it on Moodle, you know. Okay, so here's the document I want you to read. Here's some prep questions. So there's always at least, say, two to four prep questions. And it's basic things to, just to get them into the basic content of the document or the basic context of the document. And then it'll usually be sort of a couple of things at the end that'll sort of hint about where we're going. Oh, okay. And then in class, I have some kind of structure set up always. So I was actually just, so the one I know I've talked a lot about is my Chinese Peasant Rebellion Day. So I teach world history. Um, and uh, so a couple of years ago, one of the documents we were going to be reading is in two, second century BCE, the new emperor of the Qin, brand new Qin dynasty, uh, comes to power and he wants sort of to, to you know, control society. So he orders, there's an edict where all books are going to be burned, all scrolls are going to be burned, except the useful ones about like medicine and agriculture and, and treatises that support him and his family and his lineage and everything else is going to be burned. Um, so that was the document I wanted us to talk about. And so the prep questions were, what's the basic content? What's the context? Because that matters a lot. The mm -hmm. Qin Dynasty comes in right after the end of this violent, long, warring states period, it's called. And it talks about, there's a line in the document about the lowly multitudes, that the lowly multitudes don't need to be confused or distracted by these other things. So the idea I had, so those are the prep questions I had sent out ahead of time. But then when we got into class, I set it up. So the last, the, the, you know, the furthest row, because they're the highest, is the emperor and his advisors. Oh. <laughs> the next two rows down were kind of the elites and the scholars, the ones who are likely to have either written some of these tracts, these, you know, or were likely to own personal collections of scrolls. And everyone else was the peasants. So kind of in, we had those big visual divisions in class. And then it was like, all right, so they started off, you know, because they've got the document, I always want to give them an easy, concrete entry point, right? So start, you know, get yourself into smaller working teams. Start with the document that I gave you. How would you guys answer these questions? And then the last one was about sort of perspective. I asked them, how is each of you, how are you responding to this? What does this mean to you? And it was fantastic because in the back row, a quieter student who'd never really spoken much. It's a 90 student class. It's, yeah, that's a scary thing. Um, he was suddenly emperor. So he was trying <laughs> to figure out, and I don't know how he became emperor. I was not, like, I was just circulating around, right? Because then once I set it up, I let them go, right? And I just circulate. I make sure I get back around to each team two or three times for questions, but I try not to interfere in whatever process they've got going on. So suddenly he was emperor, and I thought, oh, that's quite cool. He's, he's been very quiet. He's emperor. And the, the, the next two rows down are sort of figuring out you know, do they want to risk their lives by challenging the emperor, or do they want to just kind of go along with him and burn their life's work? And then the peasants are sort of trying to figure out, and I suddenly have one group of peasants plotting a rebellion. Uh. 
you know, and I kind of stop and, and listen. And I had that moment of thinking, I'm a historian. There was no peasant rebellion during the, you know, under the, this time of the Qin Dynasty. Should I stop this? And I thought, no, I'm just going to let this go because I don't know where this is going. <laughs> and it was fantastic because by the end of it, you know, so they were kind of on their own for, say, 15 to 20 minutes normally. And this is a fairly standard structure for me. A document to get them going ahead of time, prep questions, some kind of physical structure in class, some kind of division in class, work on their own for 15 to 20, and then we come back. So it's also, you know, there's elements of, what do they call it, the puzzle method, right? They've mm, all got yes. different pieces and stuff. Yeah. But by the end of that class, my students, 90 first year students, had worked through some of these key historical thinking skills. They understood the document very well. They understood the context that this was at the end of the Warring States period. So they've just lived through a period of a lot of turmoil and violence and maybe they want peace, and that's what this guy is promising them. So most of the peasants are like, we're not going to rebel. Like, we're illiterate, so what do we care? He's leaving us the practical stuff, so that's good. You know, yeah. so I don't care about the rest. Um, and they were trying to kind of s squash the one little village that wanted to rebel. And, and then they were like, yeah, but we just came through this hard time, and how dare he take this from us? The more stereotypical response you might expect from, you know, maybe a first-year student today. Yeah. I suddenly had a collaborator in the elite. He's like, oh, if you guys want to rebel, I'll help. And I'm like, well, what do you think your motivation is here exactly? He said, well, if they win, I can, I, maybe I get to be emperor. So he, he was thinking through this. This wasn't necessarily about, oh, I want to protect my personal you know, scroll collection or I'm a scholar. He was very clear that this was about <laughs> political advancement. And then the emperor was having to try to you know, defend himself. So, I mean, that's one of my favorite examples. But. Um, I find as long as I've, I've given them the structure ahead of time, because I always teach in 75 minute blocks, but I have 90 students and 75 minutes, so I have to impose. There's some kind of structure. Mm -hmm. The biggest amount of time we normally spend is making them move, right? I don't let them stay in the same seat, so they're divided alphabetically, or they're divided, they number off one to six, and then each of the six groups has to move, or they're divided alphabetically, and they're each working on a different piece of the question, whether it's a debate, whether it's a different document. We did one this past year about, um, so after the, the Age of Revolution, so the um, American, French, and Haitian revolutions, so they had read kind of key documents from each of those three, and then they had read something from Frederick Douglass, maybe, kind of written, obviously, sometime after that fact. And the question was, revolutions for whom? So the class, kind of each team had to justify why their revolution, their document was the most important, mm -hmm. right? That if anyone knows about any of these revolutions, it should be why is the American or the French or the Haitian more important? And then there was a team that was basically the critics, right? So 19th century um, African-American saying, you're, whether the American, French, or Haitian revolutions, all three of which promised things, none of this paid off for me. So there wound up being kind of a bigger debate about what does is, what is a revolution mean? Right. Why do we look to these three as turning points about anything? Um, and it's, of course, not all 90 students can talk at once. That's not the point. Um, I create a lot of other ways. The quieter students, they can send me their own private reflections afterwards, which are fantastic. Um, um, but I'm, because I'm always circulating, I know who's working in their small groups. You know, I can tell. I'm not bothered by, you know, technology, like phones and laptops in class. I don't get into those bands. I give them something to do, like, we'll look it up, right? So I'll sometimes deliberately group, okay, who's got a laptop? Okay, you guys are in charge of looking up this bit. And I don't care if they use Wikipedia, whatever. They're doing something and they're then contributing some background knowledge yeah. to their colleagues that they wouldn't have had otherwise. So it's actually, yeah, I think I, it's so easy and automatic for me now that um, it's just, if you've put the time in, if you've got the structure ahead of time, and it's not so much knowing where I want us to go, it's knowing what I want them to play with along the way, and then where we go is kind of up to them. Yeah. You know? And I used to say, oh, I, I, don't, I don't think I could ever do this with more than 90 students, and now I'm thinking, yeah, I probably could. You know? Or um, if I could ever get a scale-up room that would let me fit my first year classes in there, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> um, I'll probably always keep some lectures in the first year because, I mean, as historians, we value storytelling. I think there's lots of ways to make even a narrative lecture actually really useful for students. I like being able to show them, especially for something like world history where the amount of content is a lot. Um, it's still a way to model. This is how you put a narrative together. Um, and then there's times where I ask them to kind of take it apart, yeah. you know, at the end of the class as well. So there's lots of ways. There's lots of ways. You just, for me, it was having Pat say, of course you can. 
oh, <laughs> all right, <laughs> Jenna. <laughs> well, and what strikes me in what you're talking about too is um, your willingness to let go of the, like your, yes. your control, yeah. right? I mean, you, yeah. you're structured, so you still have control over because you have certain objectives that you want yes. to meet when you're going yeah. through. So yeah. you're making sure that that's going to be achieved, yeah. but you're also willing to- You have to let them go. Let it go. Yeah. And sometimes I find that the most interesting. So the witch hunts, everybody wants to, I have the mock witch trial, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. everybody wants to see the witches burn and they all, <laughs> <laughs> and they all want to see like a snowball effect where all of a sudden half the class is burning, right? Like that's what they want to do. Right. But, and, and I let them go. And, and when they get really excited, then I'll say, but what about, you know, we've, this is the end yeah. of the class. What, what about this article? Yep. Could that have actually happened? And yeah. they're like, no, because blah, blah. Yeah. And then they realize actually, it's really hard to burn a witch. <laughs> much more difficult than you would think. And so, but but then they really understand that time period, right? Because they've had yes. to, um, they've had to be in the shoes mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. someone. I love the role playing stuff mm -hmm. because of the empathy factor yeah, exactly. of it. Yep. Um, but it also really makes them apply that knowledge, yes. right? And yeah. work their way through. Yeah. And they've had to think through. History's not just about, um, you know, uh, we as historians give them a bunch of facts that they have to memorize. Man, you can replace me with Google if that's all my discipline is. Yeah. You know, seriously. Yeah. That's not for me what being a historian is about at all. Yeah. It's about that thought process. Yeah. So you have that moment of thinking, should I stop this? No, because they will think through on their own yeah. why this did or did not happen. At the end of my Chinese rebellion class, I could say, okay, why wasn't there a rebellion? And they came up with it, right? Yeah. But they had that experience for themselves, whether it was the emperor suddenly realizing he might be in trouble, whether it was the sudden appearance of a collaborator, <laughs> um, whether it was the majority of the peasants saying, I'm not that. gonna rebel, you know, they, they thought through it on their own, yeah. you know, and that's, those are the thinking skills that we care more about as historians. Right. Yeah. Well, and it really shines a light on what our, you know, our present day values are. Yes. And yeah. Because <laughs> I was expecting too. the universal, you know, oh, well, censorship is bad and wrong in all contexts. And what I got was a majority of first year students saying, he's bringing me peace. He's bringing some, some security after this violent time. I'm still going to get to learn how to farm better. What do I care if yeah. he's burning the philosophical stuff? So they had this moment of thinking historically, thinking critically. Yeah. About and that's something. so applicable to so many different yeah. contexts. So yeah. it's really interesting. Yeah. Um, that letting go, you've done it's it. It's hard. Yeah, <laughs> it's hard. And you've done it in um, in a context that is even like too terrifying for me to go down the road of inquiry-based learning. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so could you tell us a little yeah. bit about so, that experience? I got I got dropped into a class at the last minute. So a few years ago, uh, Native American Studies 2500, so the old number and the old name was Canadian Indian History. And I get an email from the dean's office on the Friday, so like what, a day or two days maybe after the January term has started. Could you take over this class? <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> because the instructor has had to leave abruptly uh, for medical reasons, and I kind of think about it for a while and thought, Okay, sure, but for various reasons, you know, I'm a white historian being dropped into a class on Canadian Indian history. My students were mostly Blackfoot and Métis. It was a small class which helped, right? Sometimes you, you take risks with smaller classes mm -hmm. that are too terrifying to attempt in a bigger class. The previous instructor had already chosen and the students had already bought a textbook and a reader, and I don't use either one of those things, but I thought, well, they've already spent the money. Okay, um, but I thought, I had been wanting to try inquiry-based learning for a long time, and I thought, this is the time to do it. I've got nothing to lose, and it's the perfect setting for it as well, because it's much more, I find it so interesting that the more we learn about um, effective teaching and learning practices in kind of a Western context, the more they match up with what we know about effective teaching and learning in Indigenous contexts, mm -hmm. right? And that kind of student-centered and inquiry-based learning is so central to what I understand about indigenous ways of teaching and learning. So I thought, all right, we're gonna do this. So I went into class and I had kind of a rough, you know, idea if it failed, but I said, what do you guys wanna learn about? So we just brainstormed on the board. What do you guys, what do you wanna know? And then we stood back and we looked at some topics and I said, okay, let me see what I can do. So sometimes it was about, I wanted them to get some use out of the textbook and the reader because they'd already spent the money. So sometimes it was me looking through those books and saying, okay, we can do some reading on that topic, those topics, but what I'm also gonna give you is here's a link to a document or a website or 
um, I would try to bring in guest speakers. I would try, we, you know, watched um, some videos because there's some amazing, you know, young indigenous filmmakers out there and that kind of thing. So it kept it, it made it more uh, sort of multimedia. Um, it meant that it was, and I, again, because it was a very small class, I think I finished the term with 13 students. It was tiny, tiny, tiny. So it was easier to manage in that smaller context, you know. But it meant that for someone, for the instructor showing up, after classes started, I'm not even in their department, really. I'm just being parachuted in. They still got what they wanted out of that class. Um, and there were presentations about their research because, again, there's a key principle of sort of um, reciprocal sharing, right? The white Western model of research is you go in and ask questions and then you leave, right? And that's not an indigenous model, from what I understand, of ways of, of knowing and ways of researching. So I really wanted them to be presenting and sharing their own research with each other because they all had a research project that could take whatever form they wanted. For me, it's the fun thing when I get to teach in other disciplines is that I can kind of, it doesn't have to be an essay, right? Yeah. History students get really nervous when you say it doesn't have to be an essay because <laughs> they're good at essays and, yeah. it, and it makes them tense. <laughs> students in other disciplines are like, cool, what else can I do? Um, so whether it was a video presentation or whether it was PowerPoint, or whether it was, you know, whatever. Um, so it was, it was a nice, way because it was a small class because it was kind of a last minute I hadn't had time to overthink and over prepare and over analyze what I was going to do it was just something I'd wanted to try and the research I had been reading about inquiry-based learning just seemed to match up with the research I'd been doing about kind of indigenous ways of teaching and learning so I thought well let's try this like if, if I'm going to try it this is the class to try it and it worked out so well I had an amazing bunch of students um, and they didn't react as if it was weird at all, right? Whereas I think I might have made a group of history students a bit more nervous if I had shown mm -hmm. up. I did, I tried this in a different class last term and it didn't work very well <laughs> at all. Um, but that NAS class was just like, this is great. You know, what, what can we do? Great, all right. And, and it, then it just became my job to facilitate what they wanted to know about. Right. So it was not a survey of Canadian Indian history and here's the treaties and here's the residential schools. Of course we addressed all of that. Of course it was there, but it was coming out more organically in the questions that they had and whether it was their own research projects that they were kind of giving little updates on and whether it was a video that they had wanted to watch or whether it was, you know, and being a historian, I was still bringing in primary source documents and, you know, um, and that kind of thing. So that first class, it made me a bit, um, it was such a great payoff. It made me a bit bold and ambitious because I, I tried the same thing on a group of senior uh, fourth year um, history students last fall and they were just like <gasps> yeah why are we so, doing this you know, yeah, yeah yeah i would do it again yeah i, I usually try to reserve two or three classes for tba days yeah. and so that is and and i always say in case something comes up that you want to learn about yeah. and yeah. they're it's always like it's a way to ease them in yeah. right and they're still they're still like eh, yeah. yeah like yeah. No, i left half the schedule open yeah like you, I this had, is your job yeah <laughs> what do you guys want to know about yeah and it's so um, I think it's another reason why I love first year students so much is that for some reason first year students don't think that question is weird, oh, yeah. right? And fourth year students, they're nervous, they've been trained in what to do to get an A, you know? So I find first year students, maybe it's just the first year students that want to take my classes, get a lot more nervous when I'm trying something different. First year students never flinch, they're like, okay. Maybe yeah. because I love teaching you and I both, right? It's yeah. like it's that fall of their first year. So I think, I always think to myself, they don't know yet. They don't know yet. Yeah. <laughs> Let's show them the potential. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's show them that a big 90 student first year class, a history class, a world history class, where we're doing eh, about 10,000 years of history in 12 weeks, this can be fun, <laughs> right? We can do this. Um, first year students, you can, will just go anywhere you want to go with them. Just set it up, give them a bit of structure but they have so much energy and they're not yet so worried about, is that right? Is that what you wanted? I've done this other thing this way for four years and now you're asking me to do something else. So I find first years are just a blast. I love first years. Yeah, <laughs> me too. Yeah. They're, yeah, and they're just, and you want to make them love your discipline, right? Well, that's partly it too, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't, they're not majors, right? With 90 students, maybe a handful are majors. I convert a few every year, and that's nice. Um, and I'm okay with that. I don't, I know, you know, you hear some other faculty speak about, you know, they, they maybe don't think as highly of the first year classic because, well, they're not majors yet. I'm like, so? 
it's just about this is what history actually is. And look, history is more fun than you think it is. Yeah. You know, so maybe they'll want to take more courses in our department, or maybe they'll just think differently about what they think history is. It's about showing them a way of thinking, a way of seeing the world. And at least in our classes, like history class can be fun. Yeah. History's not just about I'm going to spew a bunch of facts at you and you're going to barf them back up on an exam. Yeah. Right? Like that's not, I don't do exams anyway, <laughs> so that's never going to happen. But <laughs> yeah. Well, and so often, you know, you get the students, I don't like social studies, you know, from yeah. this Alberta yeah. curriculum, or yeah. I don't like history, and it's like, no. Yeah. You, you haven't taken you. it from me yet. <laughs> <laughs> you are my target audience. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I also uh, wanted to ask you about textbook writing because oh, you... Oh, another shared yes. journey we've both been on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How's yours coming along? <laughs> <laughs> it's coming. It's, um, we've almost got the complete first draft, but it nice. has been really interesting because it's uh, for a British audience, oh, right? Okay. I mean, they do want to have North American students, but because it's um, a Scottish history textbook, right. it's main audience will be in Scotland yeah. and um, their environment is very different than what we have in Canada yeah. and so I am in this eternal um, conversation about you know I want I want to in encourage them to think about theoretical concepts yeah. so I'd like to make sure that gender and intersectionality are in there and I know that that might turn some of the faculty off right away but to me this is what's important right if I'm yeah. going if I'm in here as the social historian we need to be examining these concepts and yeah. so it's uh, it's interesting but I really I really like it it makes you think hard about yeah. teaching and that's that was what I was most grateful for in so many ways about the process of writing mine. So I was asked to write it. It wound up becoming my second book. And when I was asked to write it, I thought, you've got to be kidding me. I'm way too junior. Like, you know, who writes textbooks? Well, it's the big names. Especially, so it's a textbook on women in the U.S. West. And textbooks in the U.S. West history are dominated by very big names, mostly men, mostly from a certain Eastern school. Um, so I just thought, I, you've got to be kidding me. I am way too junior to be writing a textbook. I had this in my head that, no, you don't. That's something that a senior person does. I don't know if I was even tenured when I first got the invitation. And it wound up, and they said, no, we want someone, we want someone who's junior. We want someone who's very student focused, who's very excited about teaching. So this textbook isn't about, let me show you how much I know, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> it's actually something that might be useful to students because the series was meant to be kind of affordable, accessible freshman first year college textbooks really for a US market. So I'm like, okay. Um, and this was another kind of turning point in my teaching, I suppose. So I almost had a first draft of the book done. And I had followed a fairly traditional chronology. And then I happened to one summer, I was teaching a US West course in the summer for some reason. And I just said to them one day, what would the history of the US West look like if we put women at the center of it? And they just went for three hours, right? And I mean, of course, I filled the boards. I was out of board space. Oh, and I, I remember, you know, I took pictures on my phone that day. And I went home and thought, well, crap. <laughs> <laughs> because the book I thought I wanted to write that, of course, put women at the center of the US West hadn't done that at all. It had followed a much more traditional model. And my students in three hours had pointed, I hadn't said to them that that was secretly what I was fishing for. But in three hours, they had shown me everything that was wrong with what I was doing in the book. So I went home and redid and bumped my schedule back by a good year. Because I thought, wow, I really have to rethink this. It was about rethinking what would it mean to seriously put women at the center of this narrative for once, and not just as the add-on. Um, but it, the book was supposed to be very responsive to students, very readable. Um, and uh, that wound up being, it was one of the hardest things I've ever written in so many ways because of that. You know, you care about teaching and you want this to be useful. And, oh, what would that look like? What does an actual student-centered textbook look like? Because most of them aren't. You go back now and think, oh, no. <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> this isn't remotely structured. Um, whether it's the tone, whether it's the organization, whether it's the content, however it's presented. This isn't remotely what it, what's going to be good for a student. Um, so it wound up, it was hard, but I'm proud of it. I'm very proud of it um, because it is, I think, student-centered. And it does, in fact, tell a very different, it's the only book of its kind. It's the only book that literally puts the history of women of the U.S. West in the middle of the story and tells the story entirely from their perspective and therefore moves away from those traditional sign points, um, signposts that you would expect to see in, a, in that kind of textbook. But it, I mean, again, it was another good reminder of listen to your students 
right? What is because their perspective is so valuable. What do they actually want? What do you actually want to be giving them? Um, so it also it helps kind of push my teaching along, I think, in a big way, too. I have a much more skeptical eye. I mean, I was already moving away from, you know, traditional textbooks and readers by that point anyway. But it was just one more reminder of, you know, a student-centered pedagogy actually can take lots of forms. You know, and a student-centered textbook can look different. Um, but uh, I will never forget that moment of standing in class after they'd left, looking at the board and thinking, well, crap. I have to redo this book, you know. Um, but uh, once you start keeping that in mind, it becomes a bit more automatic. Listen to your students. Think about what they actually want, you know, because there's always, there's always more work to be done in terms of making your pedagogy better, obviously. There's always so much more work to be done. Yeah, well, and student center too means that you have to be constantly evolving because our students are yes. constantly evolving yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, you can't yeah. teach the same course twice. You know, there may be only minor tweaks one year. There's the, you know, every few years blow it up and start all over again entirely kind of process. Um, what's working for them? You know, and pay attention to that. Um, because it doesn't have to be about content. I mean, history is very much like the natural sciences, I think, in that we have a mass amount of content to teach. And I came face to face with this when I switched from teaching the Western Civ course to the World History course and thought, well, this is a lot, you know. Um, I saved them on day one, like 10,000 years, five continents, 12 weeks, buckle up. <laughs> <laughs> you know? um, but it, it, it meant freeing myself a bit from worrying so much about content. Yeah, because you can't, can't possibly you can't do cover it. All. And it doesn't yeah. matter how narrowly you define any course in history, you can't cover it. Not the way that a historian would think a thorough treatment would be. It's not possible. We're always making choices. So why not make choices that are a bit more focused on their learning, their own agency and voice going through the process? What other skills can you bring into it? Um, but world history has liberated me. I no longer want to hear anybody, oh, but the content, yeah, don't even. Don't even start with me. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. Um, it is a lot, but. Well, and part of your, I think, I think part of your motivation for um, teaching world history is uh, an emphasis on diversity and inclusion. So. Yeah, I have no background as a world historian. Like, you know, full disclaimer right there. I got into this with exactly zero background. I'm a historian of the North American West. Um, but, you know, the departmental tradition for a long time had been the Western Civ class, which is kind of very centered largely on Western Europe and that kind of narrative of the human past. And I just thought, yeah, it's the 21st century. We need to start telling stories about the rest of the human past and all of those other continents that we don't talk about. So that was the main motivation. And it still is, that's one of the driving forces behind the course still, is I deliberately minimize Western Europe. And I say that to them, but we work through that as kind of intellectual exercise. I said, World War One. I'm gonna talk, we're gonna do World War One without talking about the Western Front. And then we take some time to talk about what that means to them. Right? Because emotionally and in terms of pop culture, the Western Front for them is World War I. They have the family, they've got the grandfathers and they've got the great uncles and they've got you know, the, the relatives who fought and they've got movies telling them that that's all that World War I was about. So it's about making it explicit that I am going to tell you, we're going to talk about other parts of human history. We're not going to talk. I skipped Rome. That was my big step last year. Was I deleted Rome. <laughs> and I said to them, this is a weird moment for me because I just eliminated Rome. But you know what? We're going to talk about other big empires doing other things in other parts of the world. And we're going to talk about what that feels like. You know, so it was just explicit all the way along that this is about telling the stories of people from all over the world. Right. You know, um, I have no background. I can't say that enough. I'm, I, I, I'm tentatively beginning to feel like maybe I can call myself a world historian because I keep teaching this course. Um, but it was, it was absolutely diving into something I knew nothing about and I just thought should happen for the sake of our students. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and do you, um, in addition to the, the topics and the content, um, are there other ways in which you pursue diversity and inclusion in the classroom? In world history specifically? Well, any of your classes, really. Yeah, it's been about, because I'm a historian of the North American West, um, my courses have always had a great deal of indigenous content in it, and I've been trying to make that an even bigger focus, not just in my North American West classes, um, and begin to rethink kind of what that means. I think like a lot of white historians of the West, 
at the start of my career, it was sufficient to think about, well, we're going to have some readings, you know, on Indigenous people. And that's not sufficient anymore, not even remotely, especially not here, especially not here at the Oval. There are so many great resources available to us. Um, so for those courses, the, my North American courses, it's been thinking about not just indigenizing the content, but I've been reading a lot lately about decolonizing education, mm -hmm. you know, and that's what's begun to shape my teaching really across the discipline, across all the different courses that I teach, the non-geographic specific ones, um, including world history. The way it has played into world history was, of course, emphasizing most of us know very little about the history of Africa, even though it's a massive continent with its own rich history. Um, we think we know maybe slightly more about the history of, say, China or Japan. Um, so one of the joys of world history has been to introduce Asian and South Asian and African history to students who don't have a, any real background in that, I think, coming out of high school um, and saying, and this is why I make it so explicit, what does it feel to put this on the same level as Rome, right? We grow up in a world where Rome, Greece and Rome, and, and World War I is the Western Front, where those are our narratives of what history is and what matters in history. So we have a whole big conversation, at, sort of, we have two big days in the world history in the first year class to sort of explicitly pull out how are we assigning value and why do we still put so much more emphasis on these stories and not these other stories. Um, but the decolonizing my teaching has been a really interesting kind of thing to get my head around as a white scholar, as a non-Indigenous scholar, as a settler in Blackfoot territory. I think it helps that it is so um, familiar in some ways because of what we know about just good teaching and learning practices, which is it's not always about linear, and that's not, it's not the sage on the stage, I want to dump stuff out of my head onto you, that it has to be about a relationship, that it has to be about listening to your students, that it has to be about. So I've been wanting to sort of push my teaching there in other ways, especially because after, after, various, after several years away from my two third year classes, my third year US West and my third year Canadian West, I'm finally sort of able to come back around to those and those are the classes where it's most explicit, where it's not just about increasing the amount of indigenous content, it's about thinking about what would it mean to decolonize those two courses, you know, because they're very classic settler courses, right? Even the fact that I'm using these two categories of the nation state, even though I'm here in a, you know, in a you know, Blackfoot territory uh, is divided by the 49th parallel. So it's been interesting in the last couple of years to, come at it from various streams, whether it's world history, educating myself about the history right. of Africa and China, which is extremely daunting. Um, you know, my first year, you know, Monday morning, I know nothing about the history of Sub-Saharan Africa. Tuesday morning, <laughs> here's my lecture on Sub-Saharan Africa. <laughs> world War I, when you consider the rest of the world, is a nightmare, absolute nightmare, because there's a lot going on. It's a call to World War for a reason. So that's been a learning curve for me. But it has dovetailed in interesting ways with wanting to sit back and shut up and really take seriously and listen to indigenous scholars and indigenous ways of teaching and learning and see where I can bring that in. Not just in my, the obvious courses about the North American West, but more broadly, yeah. you know, sort of as a, as a pedagogical um, choice. Right, and it really um, works towards your research, your current research yeah. as well yeah. on Borderlands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I am a Borderlands historian, you know, my starting point is always the borders are stupid, and that <laughs> and that just dovetails beautifully with indigenous histories because you know certainly borders are stupid for them as well. No, no external settler-imposed border has ever really paid off for an indigenous um, nation. So it helps that I think that that's partly my own research trajectory. Um, I think it helped a bit as well, even with world history or even with. Um, attempting to decolonize and even think through what it would mean to decolonize my North American West courses. My starting point is that these categories are arbitrary, yeah. you know, and I'm always interested in what's on the other side. It's how I became a Borderlands historian, I think. What's on the other side of that fence? Why is that fence there? That's kind of a dumb fence. Let's think about <laughs> taking apart that fence, you know, and somehow that got me into world history, so. <laughs> You just have to follow your route, right? Your path, <laughs> wherever it leads you. So yeah. Your teaching journey. Yeah, yes. Which might be a great way for us to end. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us. That was a great conversation. Happy to be here. As yeah. always. Thanks, Janine. Okay.